those situations where we are able to select rooms inside a nice house, so lovely. But the reality is when we're out and about filming in, in corporate interviews, the choices we have are really limited and even those choices can often be far from ideal. This is a pretty standard interview situation that we're going to be faced with, a very bland meeting room. I have all my gear, which I'm going to use to make it work, but these are the main issues we have. No real interesting background, no real control over the light. We do have blinds, we can't cut out light completely. The walls are very reflective, so if you want anything stylized, it's going to be a problem. But I would say the biggest issue we have is over here. This is a very busy road. And this is going to be very distracting for our interviews. These are all situations that I need to overcome to make this work. And sometimes you just have to make it work. It's so important if you do have noise like this road is to make sure that the brain can tune it out as in the viewer's brain. So you either need to see it or you need to reference it somehow. I don't really want to see cars in the background of my shot. So this is a real problem. I need to figure out how I'm going to do this. And it will reflect on the position I have of the interviewee. I could do a cutaway of cars going past, but how would that fit in to the video we're making? What if it's nothing to do with this location or cars or anything? This is just a room we need to do a generic interview in. That's always going to be a problem. Remember when we talked about going into that lounge, we turned the lights on and off and we tried to see what we could do. So I'm actually going to close all the blinds and I'm also going to close the windows because that should help us, it will help us with that road noise. Right, it's given us a bit more control. And I think it's, it's quite good. I'm going to close the door now and see if that helps. Still hear the traffic. And we also have a bit of issue with skin tones right now. A lot of green coming in. So I am going to use my own light, of course. I'm just going to take over the main light, but we're going to get, still get bits of green on there. So whether I use that or not, maybe because it does give us a very different background from when we had the blinds open. But the sound is the biggest issue and you need to make sure you can figure out a way past it, otherwise it is going to be a huge problem. And what is going to help you is the right sort of microphone. So this could well be used to me. So this is what I've decided to go with. The window open, bright light to try and match the exposure outside so we can see the cars out of focus going past, which helps our brain tune out that noise. It's not ideal, but these sort of things are all about compromise. This is not the ideal situation for interview, but rarely will you ever have that ideal situation. So let me show you some more of the stuff I have set up. The camera I'm using is a video camera. Sarah is operating it and has a long lens on it. That's part of how we're getting that look in that shot. It's compressing the background down. We're also about three-point lighting, and again, I'm not doing it. There's a lot of light coming in, and I'm using that. There's no point putting any more light up. I'm getting so much fill from the room, and there's no point putting a backlight because I have so much behind as well. Audio. We are going to be recording audio directly into the video camera, but if you're using a DSLR that doesn't have proper connections, audio recorders are really important, especially one with a proper XLR connections on. Which mics do you use? Well, we talked about these before, but a close mic is so important. Using wireless labs, so you get the mic nice and close like I have here. And we're also going to be using this shotgun. So this is actually really important. It gives us a backup sound, but it's also really good at hiding a lot of background noise because it is so directional. Whereas a mic on here picks up all the sound around, this is much more focused. So we have our shotgun microphone, XLR cable into Sarah's camera on a standard boom pole, held onto the C stand with a boom buddy. You don't need to have a C stand. C stands are great, lovely light stands, but very heavy and quite expensive. A good solid light stand would be great. 
Make sure you do have some counterweight holding it on though because otherwise it's gonna fall over. And as with any lighting stand, put the front leg forward, stops it falling over. Okay, what about mic placement? Well, just above me, just out of frame. You wanna get the mic as close as possible and it's pointing at my heart rather than my mouth. So if I do move forward a little bit, it means I will still stay on mic. It will still pick up some road noise. It's not gonna get completely away because it is very visible. Hence, we need to see that sound as we are right now. We also do have a lav mic on. So hopefully with the right mixture of these two mics, we should get some really good sound. I don't normally have a mic in shot like this lav. This is for effect, I wanna show you how I really will put on the lav. Because I like to hide microphones, I like to see them whilst we have a microphone in here. Why would I wanna see that? I don't wanna see that. Also, I don't wanna see this. So you hide them. I use these undercovers. It's a little sticky here and the mic sits on it. Dead center of the sticky. Then you put on a little bit of felt. Uh, depending on what color people are wearing, Julian's wearing a blue, so I'm putting on a gray, which is close I've got. I've got black, white, and gray. Then you have two options. You can either put the mic on yourself, because I want to put it on his chest and it sits about here inside, or I can ask him to do it. Uh, I think it's gonna have to be a combination of both. Don't take the sticky off yet. If you take the sticky off too soon, it's gonna start sticking to chest hair or fluff or anything like that. Wait till it's in there, then pull it off and then stick it on. So I'm gonna pass it through Julian's t-shirt, thank you. And take this way, we'll take the sticky off now. And we'll put it back in there. Sorry, I'm just gonna just put this about here. And we'll put this down on the floor. How does that sound? Does it sound okay? And talk to me, talk to the camera 10 seconds, please, Julian. One, two, three, four, five, six, How's that seven, sound? eight. Okay, great, and you can hear this one okay, clearly? Great, okay. So now we've looked at how to deal with uh, backgrounds, working with light and very important sound. What do we actually ask the interviewee? How do we get the information from them? Well, there's a number of techniques which are important. First thing is I would never go in hard with a question. Always do a little bit of small talk to warm people up. Never give the questions to the interviewee beforehand because what's gonna happen then is they're gonna see them and they're gonna start thinking of answers and start rehearsing them. You want things to be as natural as possible. When you do arrive and you meet your interviewee, don't chat about what you're gonna talk about because they could say something really interesting and you'll miss it. Just talk about stuff which is disconnected. I'm gonna interview Julian and we're gonna have a sort of a real life scenario. Julian is um, a filmmaker, but he's also a painter. So this is what I'm going to talk about for this interview. Julian, tell me, um, what did you have for breakfast today? I had some, uh, I had some muesli with little pieces of banana cut into it and some honey over the top of it. Uh, is that sort of thing you have most days? It's what I have when I don't have much time in the morning, so when I need a quick breakfast. So I've almost kind of run out of things to talk about about breakfast really. You need to find a subject to do that sort of warm up with them which is of interest to them really and you find something which you can connect. So if you're in their home you can look around and you can see like uh, movie posters from French films and you know that he loves French films you can ask him about that that's really good. If you're in a generic location like this which isn't where he lives you need to do a little bit of research so whilst this interview is about his painting I know He's also a filmmaker, I know those connected, but I also know that he loves paddleboarding. So I don't want to start hard on the questions which are going to be part of the interview. And if he's never done an interview before, I really want him to relax as much as possible. Oh, I saw you're into um, paddleboarding. Yep. So tell me, what is that? Uh, so it's like a giant surfboard uh -huh. that you stand up on. Um, you can do it in waves, but most, uh, most often you just do it on flat water. Standing on it? Yep, standing they up. They fall off? No, nope, they're quite wide, so they're very stable. We're talking about like, like this, like this. Um, so all this sort of stuff is completely useless for my, my film I'm making about his painting. But, or maybe, I don't know, but it's something 
little it's not to be I'm not I don't want to use this this is really just to get him relaxed as much as possible and a number of things I'm doing which you wouldn't no, do I during the interview which is sort of interrupting and a little bit talking over uh-huh that sort of stuff so a number of key things you always need to remember don't have questions on your lap if you are going to have them if you're really concerned about oh I don't know what my questions are don't look at them during an interview because what happens this is what happens it's monkey see monkey do so we're chatting away blah 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 so tell me about the uh, where do you actually go paddle boarding William? Uh, well I live quite close to um quite close to the... So as I look down, he always follows my eyes. So if you want to look at your questions, look at your questions between answers. And also if you are operating the camera yourself and you want to keep checking it's in focus and levels, the same thing is going to happen. If you keep looking over to the side, they're going to follow wherever you go. You start scratching your nose, they'll start scratching their nose. Their head, start twitching around, start slapping the side of their face, they'll do it as well. Go on, you can do it. Go on, there we go. <laughs> the other really important thing is that eye contact. Don't let your eyes drift. Always maintain that eye contact and show them that you are really interested. Make sure the interviewee doesn't wear sunglasses. You need to have that connection with them. Make sure you don't wear sunglasses as well. So it's important that you both see each other, both the viewer sees them as well. So these are all important factors to think about. Okay, what type of questions do we ask? Well. There's things called open questions and closed questions. I'm going to start off first with closed questions. So Julian, how long have you been painting for? Pretty much since I can remember. Do you like it? Yeah. Um, do you use oils? Uh, not that much. Awful, awful questions followed by awful answers. Not his fault, totally my fault. Those questions are really closed down. So the first one was, how long are you painting for? And he gave me a simple answer, which was, as long as you remember. Here's an example of an open question of that same thing. So, Julian, tell me about how you got into painting, your first memory of that. I, um, I don't really remember when it is that I started painting, um, because as far as I can remember, I've always been at least drawing, um, my first memories of it was, for some reason I really, like, really liked clowns when I was quite young, and um, I rolled out a huge long uh, roll of paper, which I think was uh, a roll of wallpaper, and then just drew clowns all along it, the whole length of the house. That sounds kind of scary. I always thought, um, kids, I'm scared of clowns. I'm surprised you're not scared of clowns. Um, so. Where did it go from, from clowns? Um, then I kind of started drawing friends and, um, uh, and relatives and uh, family members on a uh, little A4 uh, print paper. Um, eventually I kind of got bored of that and uh, wanted to do a bit more colour. So I would... His answer was actually like really long. Now for ma imagine we're doing like a, a two minute, two minute documentary. Uh, That's too long. So how do you get him to shorten that? The most simple way is to just explain. That was terrific, Julian, but um, we, we only got a short piece of time, amount of time for this, so could we just shorten it into maybe just focus on just, uh, you know, the, maybe, the, the, maybe the printed paper, just using the non-professional things. We, we'll get into professional stuff in a minute. So these are ways that you can work with things. Um, and if you don't get it right the first time, ask again. Don't keep pushing it though. If after the second time it's still too long, drop it and come back later. And hopefully they've got more chance to relax and you can maybe word it in a different way. Another really important tip is if you are not going to be heard in the interview, your voice, you need to make sure that they, the interviewee, gets their question in the answer. It needs to be encapsulated. So the easiest way to do this is simply go, Julian, so my voice is not going to be heard in this. So. If I say something like, um, how long have you been painting for? Uh, instead of you saying, well, as long as I can remember, if you could say, I have been painting for as long as I remember, that way it's 
gets past that. So these are the sort of things you need to remember, is always try and encapsulate the question as much as possible. You don't always need it, and sometimes it becomes a bit repetitive if they repeat your question each time, but it is really useful. Otherwise, you don't know what they're actually going to be talking about. Okay, so we need to shorten these answers, and we need to be a little bit more focused, because my questions were, were slightly too open, too generic. I simply said, tell me about something. Let's talk about something more specific so he can get a little bit more into it. What is it you like to paint? Um, it's always portraits. I think I drew one landscape, but I didn't enjoy it because there are rules to drawing and painting portraits, um, whereas nature is a lot more random. And I think architecture is too rigid and too straight. Okay, so that works fine. We didn't get the question into the answer. He just said, uh, it's always portraits. Whether we need that or not, I don't know. It really depends on where you think that's going to go in your edit, because if it's going to go right at the beginning, then it's not going to make sense. But if it's going to go after other parts of the interview, of course we know exactly what he's talking about. But maybe to cover ourselves, we'll add that in. So would you mind just adding in my question into that answer, please? And I think that's it's good. I think we should focus more on the positive rather than the things you the things you like rather than the things you don't like. Because you talked about, uh, you know, I don't like this, this, and this. But it's all about why you like portraits so much. Okay, so Julian, tell me, what is it that you like to paint? I always paint portraits because there are rules to it, um, rules of facial proportions. Um, but what's great about them is that every person is different. So you're always uh, using those rules and breaking them to draw the person that you're drawing. So these are all great answers and you know, they're all exactly what I'm after. You need to decide before you go into the interview, what is it you're trying to get out of them? What do you need to tell the story? Where do you want to go with this? So otherwise you could end up just talking for hours. You don't want to do that. You want to keep it to a, a manageable length. So just try and figure out your questions beforehand. Don't give it to the interviewee. Have them for yourself and listen though. If you have a, a piece of paper, I remember doing an interview for a a big program for broadcast TV years ago, and it was a very well done interviewer, and he just had a list of questions that he was given, and he just went through them each, each of them, and the answers he was given were terrific, and they did, should have led to a follow-up question, but he didn't, he went to the next one, and the next one, the next one, and what happened at the end of the interview was he turned to the director and said, anything more? And the director went, yeah, if we go back to that first answer, where she said this, so let's pick up on that. So it's so important to listen. You can go back to your questions after, and remember, don't look at your questions during the actual interview, between answers. So have a listen and do a follow-up. Julie, tell me, where are some of the most memorable places that you've painted? Uh, my favorite place to paint was probably at my mother's old place in France. Um, but a uh, recent memorable place is uh, I've quite recently got into skydiving and I've, uh, I tried to do a painting whilst jumping out of an airplane. So what sort of materials do you use to paint? Canvas, paper, oils? Um, it's mostly on canvas these days. So you may be wondering, why on earth did I not go and pick up on what he just said about skydiving? My follow-up question shouldn't have been about his materials, it should have been, you painted while skydiving? That sounds kind of challenging. How did that go for you? I tried to. It didn't turn out very well. That's the follow-up question. Otherwise, don't it, just listen to what the person is saying. Don't ignore it. Don't be rigid with your questions. It's a conversation after all. And conversations go off in different tangents and go with it. You sometimes do need to focus it back onto what you're after. If we ended up in a, a whole talk about skydiving, that would be wrong. But it's fine to go off on a little tangent and then bring it back in again. If you do have somebody who just keeps talking, I have had that. Somebody answered a question, I think it was like 20 minutes in, they hadn't taken a breath. How do you stop them? Well, it is tricky because any sort of interruption will come across as a bit rude. So one thing that I do, which I shouldn't really say on camera because it's going to give away my trick, is if you're monitoring sound or you had the camera next to you, is you're like, 
I'm, I'm really sorry, but something wrong with the camera right now. Uh, it's error 13. Uh, I'm really sorry, I'm gonna just restart, take the battery in and out. And seems fine now. So sorry about that. Uh, if we could do that uh, question again, but it's a little bit too long. Um, if we can make it sort of like 30, 40 seconds, that would be great. The reason why I've made up a, a fake error is simply because if you say your card's full um, or your battery is depleted, they could say grumpily, why didn't you put a new battery in? Why didn't you put a new card in? Error 13, the fake error 13 is your sort of like, it's not my fault, mate way of getting a, way, a nice sort of interruption, a polite interruption, so you can carry on and get the interview back on track. Especially if you've got like your car on a parking meter, you're like starting to panic, like, I've only got 20 minutes left and that one answer was 20 minutes long. How am I going to finish this? There are ways to interrupt politely. Try and use them. Thank you very much, Julian. I think we've, we've heard enough of your painting. Actually, we haven't. I think somebody should make a, a mini documentary on you about that. Uh, I think it's time to try and find another setup in this room. Interviews won't always go the way you want them to. In Portrait of a Boxer, my interview was a little bit of a struggle. English not being Festin's well, first language, combined with not my best questions ever. The other issue I had was because the length of the piece was so short and I had strict stipulation from the client as to how many words I could actually use in it because I needed to pay for the translation. I had many limitations. Here is an unedited section of the interview. How many times have you um, had uh, bobber fights in the ring? Well, how many times? How many times? About 10 times. 100 times like sparring and, yeah. and things different. So let's get you to say I've I fought, I fought, I had prob, 10 proper fights in the ring. All right. Let's get to say that, okay. How many fights have you had? Well, I had proper ones, I had 10 fights. Just get you to do that again, just so it sounds a bit simpler. Like, I've had, I've had 10 proper fights in the okay. ring. Okay. Okay. How many fights have you had? I had 10 proper fights in the ring. How many of those have you won? All. That's, it, that's good, so say something like, and I've won every single one of them. How many have you won? I won every single of them. Okay, do that once more. How many times? How many of them have you won? Every single of them. But you say I've won every single one. Of them. Okay, I forgot the That's one. Okay, so how many? How many have you won? I, I won all of uh, every single of them. Just do that once more. Just it's okay. How many? How many of those fights have you won? I won every single of them. And how many of them were knockouts? Uh, two, and some of them was stopped in the first round. That's good. So why, why don't you say something like, I've had two knockouts and two of them have been stopped in the first round. Something like that would be really good. How many of you had knockouts and how many have been stopped in the first round? Well, I had two knockouts and maybe three or four stops stopped in the first round. Do people have a nickname for you? Uh, no. But it worked for me because I was able to take his answers, piece them together and cover them up with lots of lovely B-roll shots. I had 10 proper fights in the ring. I won every single of them. Two knockouts and maybe three or four stopped in the first round. So the Belgians could send in a 747 full of paratroopers. And we went in there and waited and then they said, well, this plane is landing and it landed. One of the major benefits of shooting in 4K on an HD timeline is the ability to reframe and crop your image without losing any quality. Doing it in camera means you have to zoom in. Ideally, you've got a zoom lens for your interview, but you have to make that decision then and there and you cannot change it. And if you do want to crop, you are going to lose quality if it's the same resolution as you're editing on. This really is one of those key things about 4K that we love so much. Using it to have that flexibility in post when editing on an HD timeline. Yes, you can crop in on a 4K timeline, depends on how good your source is. Although I can't properly show you in this episode because this is a 4K video, a 4K sequence and a 4K source. I don't have any 
8K interviews, only time lapses. But this gives you an idea of what it would look like. Just imagine it without any loss of image quality when you crop in. Uh, he must have married my mother uh, during one of his leaves from the army because when I was conceived, he was allegedly in India. If you want to be able to cut from a, a wide to a tight without using resolution and without zooming in and changing your shots, then you're going to need a second camera. And I do that quite a few times on my corporate work. And on this documentary with my dad, it worked really well. Having a slider on the second camera really complemented the main wide shot cutting between the two. It gave me a way of cutting up my dad's answers to make them shorter and make them more concise. You can always use B-roll, of course, to cover any seams, but if you don't have enough B-roll, a second camera is great. In these next two setups, I'm going to show you two examples, one using the slider example and one with the camera very close to the other one with different focal lengths.